Hello, I'm Michael Sargent, and I'd like to express my thanks for the opportunity to participate in this ongoing conversation on the birth of the UN edition. Let me here share my screen. My dream of electronic textual presentation is of a set of multivalent entities floating in cyberspace, each one representing a text or a version of a text or a manuscript or a language or a scribe or a providence or whatever. The reader could dock on any level of these, one of these arcologies of information and it would display the multiplicity of forms that it comprises. The reader could, for example, choose the default form of the text, the edition, constructed according to the judgment of the editor or editors who had worked through all of the various forms of the text, or select a different form of the text according to his or her own particular interests. All readings of all versions of the text would be presented as an apparatus, and the variants would rearrange themselves to reflect the reader's choice of the base text. I'm not computer literate enough to accomplish such an edition. I'm only capable of approaching aspects of it in print publishable form. But I wonder how such a work might be accomplished. In my limited experience, when I describe such a fantasy to an IT person, he stops me partway through and says, oh yes, I've got something that will do exactly what you want and pulls off the shelf something that was designed for an entirely different purpose and which in fact does not do what I want. I have to change what I want to make it conform to what the software on offer will do. I suspect that we will need to design the software that does accomplish what we envisage. And I believe that the most useful role for me to play at this point is to make suggestions based on my own pencil and paper experience collating and editing texts for things that we will need to keep in mind. In 1992, I produced an edition of Nicholas Love's Mirror of the Blessed Life of Jesus Christ, the primary Middle English version of the Pseudo Bonaventura and Meditaciones Vitae Christi for a series of best text editions published by Garland. Pushing the critical limits of the series I collated my base manuscript, Cambridge University Library Manuscript Additional 6578, which belonged to Mount Grace Charterhouse in Yorkshire, written during Love's Prior there in the early 15th century, with another CUL Manuscript Additional 6686 that was nearly identical in date, text, and dialect. I also collated specimen passages from six points in the text, totaling some 2,300 words out of somewhat more than 100,000 for all surviving originally complete manuscripts. This preliminary collation demonstrated three primary versions of the text, designated alpha, beta, and gamma, distinguishable in several ma major variations of a paragraph or more in length, plus a number of minor variants throughout. The collation also demonstrated two or, or three subversions of each of the primary versions. Presented by the University of Exeter Press with the opportunity to produce a full critical edition of Love's Mirror published in 2005, I produced a complete collation of all manuscripts written in the first quarter of the 15th century, including at least the three earliest manuscripts of each variational group or subgroup, a total of 27 manuscripts. All later manuscripts were also collated but only for those readings that occurred in the first 27. What I termed the noise level of random readings that might demonstrate the affiliations among the later manuscripts of the various subgroups could thus be limited while the difference among the affiliational groups and subgroups would stand out more clearly. In this graphic representation, each surviving manuscript of each version is listed in approximate chronological order of production. Some of the manuscripts are listed more than once, either because they represent conflations of different versions of the text, or they change exemplar for distinct sections of the text. 
As I have noted elsewhere, such a presentation of information is limited by the two-dimensional flat page format characteristic of the print edition. The same information can also be presented in a form compatible with three dimensions, although here still in two dimensions. Imagine this flat page as a cylinder with the affiliational group sigma, alpha, beta, and gamma as points on the circle that it inscribes. The lower level subgroup sigma, alpha, one through three, beta, one and two, and gamma, one and two, are points on further circles suspended from alpha, beta, and gamma. And the various individual manuscripts, uh, individual manuscript sigma, are points suspended from the subgroup sigma in the same way. The result is seven lower level cones of diffusion suspended from three higher cones of diffusion representing the alpha, beta, and gamma versions of the text. The omega point at the top of the previous chart representing the hypothetical Ur text has been deleted. I no longer believe that there was such a single Ur text. This simple graphic representation was generated by hand. And the individual manuscripts are presented as equidistant from each other, suspended further down the page, according to the relative chronology of their production. In a more sophisticated three-dimensional cybernetic version, the group sigma alpha, beta, and gamma, the subgroup sigma alpha one through three, beta one and two, and gamma one and two, and the individual manuscript sigma would be better represented as separated from each other by the Levenstein distance of their variation. In computational linguistics, Levenstein distance is the measure of the number of changes required in order to turn one string into another. The strings kitten and letter, for example, have a Levenstein distance of three. The initial K must be changed to an L, the I to an E, the N to an R. In a medieval text without standard spelling, the editor would have to decide what to count as a unit of variation. Whether to count, for example, variant readings, allographs, that might have lexical or morphosyntactic significance, such as a Northern dialect third person singular present tense verb form ending in S rather than F, but mistaken by a later scribe for the plural form of a cognate noun or a Southern dialect third person singular present tense verb form ending in F, mistaken by a Northern scribe for a simple past tense form transcribed as et. And the remainder of the text changed to past tense in order to conform. Both of these things occur in texts that I have collated. Chronology need not be presented as a spatial axis at all, as it is presented vertically in this chart, but could be incorporated by building a temporal component into the presentation itself. In a timed presentation, for example, new manuscripts and versions of the text could blink into existence at appropriate times and would normally remain from that point on since we can usually assume for late medieval manuscript books as we cannot for modern prints that they continued to be read and even copied for some time after their production. In my fantasy, a reader landing on any manuscript sigil should be able to access a text based on that manuscript with all others relegated to an apparatus that could be accessed by highlighting a word or phrase and clicking on it. In terms of input, this would require a complete transcription of each manuscript of the text, identification of lexical lemmata to obviate the problem of spelling variation, and software capable of flipping the apparatus, depending on the choice of base text. Individual readings would have to be coded for whether they represent symbol spelling and dialectal morphological variants, which are usually but not always significant in consideration, consideration of textual affiliation. The apparatus should also be capable of being scoped to present, for example, an apparatus of alpha manuscript variants or of alpha one manuscript variants should the reader choose to focus in 
on variations at the group or the subgroup level. Landing on one of the affiliational group sigma would trigger an editorial form of the text should the editor choose to provide one. And again, I do not envisage the necessity of an omega form of the text, except as a point from which to trigger comparison of the affiliational group variations. This is after all, an unedition. Nor does the graphic representation need to be presented as descending, a relic of the pedigree orientation that Joseph Bédier noted a century ago as a flaw in the conceptualization of recension. In fact, if the graphic representations were conceptualized in three dimensions, the alpha, beta, gamma, alpha one through three, beta one and two, and gamma one and two points could all be presented as the center points of global variational clusters of texts. More recently, I've been working to complete the critical edition of Walter Hilton's Scale of Perfection, a text in two books written separately in the last decades of the 14th century. Book one circulated for some time without book two. Among the 52 surviving manuscripts in English, there was also a contemporary Latin translation, 17 originally comprised complete copies of book one alone. 23 comprised both, both books, of which two at least originally contained only the first book. Two comprised book two alone, and one comprises an English book one and a Latin book two. 11 manuscripts present fragments or extracts. In the latter half of the 20th century, A.J. Bliss and S.S. Hussey came close to producing recensionist critical editions of the scale. Bliss for book one, and Hussey for book two. But flaws and gaps in their work have required at least a degree of recollation and reconceptualization. I collated the whole of scale two anew for an edition published by the Early English Text Society in 2017. Um, Hussey's original collation had gone missing over the years. Um, the results of the tabulation of the variants did not produce the typical recensionist cascade of bifurcation but a rhizome with seven English branches ranging from one to 15 manuscript or print witnesses plus the Latin. I am presently in process of reducing Bliss's collations of scale one, which seem to be appropriately accurate, but which I will still test to a critical apparatus that will then be tabulated to produce a final description of the affiliations of the text. These are two pages out of Bliss's three sets, four sets of collations. You'll notice that the collations comprise different sets of manuscripts for the same section of text. My own observations in the process of first working through the collations, I'm nearly two thirds of the way through. Second, Bliss's textual discussions. And third, those of Rosemary Burt's Dollwood before him and Chorus, much correspondence between Bliss and Dollard, point in the direction of a pattern of affiliations somewhat more complex than that for scale two, as should be expected. This presentation is a bottom-up version of the same kind of graphic presentation that you have already seen for the text of Nicholas Lobb's mirror. Again, imagine this pattern projected onto a cylinder. So that, for example, the point descending from M here is the same as the one going up from Latin, Latin there. Um, imagine this pattern projected onto a cylinder with each of the affiliational subgroups surrounded by a separate cone of diffusion. And again, without an or text omega point. This presentation will have to be revised when I have completed the tabulation of textual variants for book two. And I hope to be able to produce a rhizomorphic um, chart as I did with, um, with, with scale two. A text surviving in more than one manuscript like Mandeville's Travels 
would add a further set of compl complications, even at the level of collation. Marguerite Porret's Miro de saint Armes en Yanti, for example, a book originally circulating in Ainu, burned together with its author in Paris in 1310, written, um, survives in a single complete manuscript in Francian dialect, that is the dialect of, of the Parisian area, written at the turn of the 16th century, a late 14th century extract in the author's original Picard, a flawed English translation made from the French, a literal Latin translation made from that, a, lateral tr a Latin translation made from the original French that seems to have circulated primarily in Northern Italy, and two recensions of an Italian version made from that. In an attempt to compare these ver versions closely, I produced a collation <coughs> excuse me, of the two chapter passage that survives in all versions not at the word by word level, but at the level of comparable short pages, uh, short phrases. Since the English version and its Latin translation on the one hand, and the continental European Latin version and the Italian translation based on it, both derived from the French, I positioned the two versions of the French text in the middle with the others on either side. There's a further column of comments at the far right. The textual conclusion that I drew from this collation, contrary to that of others working with this text, is that neither the French, the English, nor the continental European Latin version is uniformly superior as a representative of what Marguerite may originally have written. The study of this text demands attention to all the various versions. This level of textual comparison needs further investigation. What I've presented today is a set of thought experiments drawn from the development of my own thoughts over time on how we might better conceptualize visually the relations, particularly for me, the textual affiliations of the medieval manuscripts that we study. I hope you find them useful. Thank you.